Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I hope this episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, subscribe to my channel. You'll never miss a thing. Well, did you see that Meta released its roadmap for AR and VR? I share some interesting content like that and also a whole lot of other things every Friday in my free newsletter called On The Rise. If you haven't subscribed to it, I would encourage you to do that. There's a lot more than just the podcast. You can go to ontherisenewsletter.com and subscribe today for free. You can leave any time, but I think you're going to absolutely love the On The Rise newsletter every Friday. And today's episode is also brought to you by Compassion. Compassion, do you know that Compassion deals directly with the local church? So they sponsor about 2.2 million kids around the world. But that aid is delivered to every family, to every child through the power of the local church. So when you subscribe to a Compassion Child, when your church partners up with Compassion, you are directly helping the local church around the world. And if you're worried that being involved with Compassion is going to be some heavy lifting, just the opposite. They do all the work. In fact, when I was a lead pastor, uh, we partnered up with Compassion and my wife and I still sponsor kids. We're still involved with our church, but I'll tell you, they do all the work and they allow your people to make a difference around the world. We have hundreds of kids sponsored through our church and your church can do the same thing. So you can visit compassion.com slash carry for more information. Now let's dive into this week's episode. Albert, it's good to be together. Good to be back again. And <laughs> welcome back to the podcast. Yeah. So we're here at a three-day preaching masterclass, yeah. which I'm really honored to be a part of. Uh, I would love to start here. What makes for great preaching in your mind? Mm, um, clarity. Um, being a good storyteller. Mm. Like Jesus was a phenomenal storyteller, yeah. and he was also very relevant. So it was really big for him for you to understand what he was saying, so much so the kingdom of God. Think about how hard it is to explain the kingdom of God <laughs> to people who've never heard anything. And you're a rabbi coming to talk about it. But he'd look at them and say, yeah, you guys, are, y'all work in the fields. You're in agriculture. You're the, the kingdom of God is like that plow right there. If you start on that plow, you got to keep going straight. And them lines are going to get off. And you can't touch it and turn back around. That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like that. You can't start and turn back around. So he was very applicable. It was important for it to make sense. Sometimes preachers, we think it's important for people to know how much we studied. Mm -hmm. um, or we think it's important for people to know intellectually all of the theological underpinnings of all these things. At the end of the day, Jesus says, I want you to understand what the kingdom is. And I want you to understand who I am. And good preaching should help people fall more in love with Jesus and fall more in love with the Bible. Hmm. So clarity, yeah. storytelling, yeah. any other features in your mind that you're like, wow, that makes a great... Like, I'm thinking about connection with the audience, which is something Absolutely. that's really hard to do. Yeah. And you either have it or you don't. And good storytelling helps with that. Good True. storytelling True. helps uh, connect with the audience. Um studied, like being a student of God's Word. The E. Dewey Smith, Dr. E. Dewey Smith, passes an amazing church out in Atlanta. He's saying one of his big concerns is that we live in such a tweet culture that we are starting to write tweet sermons and writing sermons for the real, for reals on Instagram, and not writing sermons for reals people in our, in our audience. So this 30-second writing something to go viral, um, you end up at the very shallow end of the pool, and you never really leave there. And he just said, I'm just concerned because people are so highly incentivized to get something to go viral that we are missing the opportunity to get something that's deeply formative for people in their souls. So for the preacher, huh. stepping your game up and studying, investing in the Word, and presenting something that has been in the crock pot, not something that's been in the microwave. Mm -hmm. because you can taste the difference. How is effective preaching different from effective communication? For example, TED Talks, we've had Chris Anderson on the podcast, etc. There's a lot about effective communication, and I think you could make the argument that clarity and storytelling and connection with the audience is a really important part of communication. But is there, uh, like, is there anything that makes preaching, other than the fact that you know, you're preaching the Word of God, yeah. that makes preaching distinct, a quality in a preacher that may not be present in a uh, quality communicator. Hmm, I'm not sure. I think Yeah, I, I, preaching, I wasn't sure either. Preaching is driven by a 
a proclamation and 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 bringing them to a place of transformation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the main difference. A lot of preachers go into businesses um, and give inspirational talks. I've even been yeah. asked to come and we just we just like you as a communicator. Can you can you just talk and encourage our leaders? We're not Christian and we don't want to. I really struggle with that because I when I communicate, I have an agenda. And the agenda is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to bring you to that place of decision, of wrestling, of, mm. of coming before God. And it's like, God, what do I do with you? After hearing this sermon, I need to do as the old, as the old preacher would say, do business with God. Right. So I think there are a lot of transferable skills, but inevitably the preacher's agenda is driven by the book, not some late latest theory or theme or some way of, no, we're driven by that book. So I come from a really sort of interesting tradition, Presbyterianism, Calvinism, Mm -hmm, et cetera. mm -hmm. I'm non-denominational now. But one of the things that was interesting in the Reformation is the Roman Catholics, I might get this number wrong, the internet will correct me, had seven sacraments. Mm -hmm. And Protestants, as a rule, have two. Mm -hmm. So we have baptism and we have communion. But in the Presbyterian tradition, you are a pastor of the Word and Sacrament. Mm. It's really interesting because you have to be authorized to preach the Word. But if you look at what happens functionally, it's like we guard the sacraments like crazy. Like, you're not ordained. Get your hands yeah, away yeah, from them. Do touch not it. touch. Yeah. But it's like, hey, you want to preach this weekend? You know, da-da-da-da-da. And, interesting. And we're not, we're not as serious about that. And it always made me think, like, there's something that happens not every Sunday— Definitely. But as someone who's preached for 25 years, every once in a while it feels sacramental. Have you ever had that where you think something bigger than the words is happening here? Oh, yeah. Well, that's what we live for. Uh huh. We live Uh for that. Some people describe it as an out of body experience. It's like, it's as if God is doing something so profound in the room. I, it's as if I have stepped out of my body and I am watching God do something in me and through me. That's just un, just un, un, unimaginable. So that so there is this bigger moment, and and that's what that's what you want to swing for. That's you, that's 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 the best of the best. Yeah. Uh huh. So let's break that down a little bit because I can think about the number of times, and it's not uh, definitely not every Sunday, it's happened. But I would love. Okay, so think about like if you're going for that viral moment. Yeah. So you're trying to blow up on TikTok, trying to blow up on Reels or whatever. Um, I think this might be Charles Stanley. I can't remember who. But, you know, the the best thing I can do when I'm really in the zone, I am not thinking about how I'm doing. Yes, absolutely. What are you thinking about when you have those transcendent moments? Like, what happens when I'm not thinking, like, I bet you everybody's going to tweet this. I bet everyone's this going to blow up on TikTok. Oh, my goodness. Like, what, what is happening inside you when you hit those transcendent moments? I I am in awe of the reality of the presence of God. Hmm. Um and I can feel it as if it's it's just tangible. So usually I'm not even th- I'm thinking stay out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Let God yeah. get all the glory, release your I there have been times when I've just released my sermon notes where we've had a service where I didn't even preach the whole sermon. We just did ministry at the altar uh, because people had come down and we had responded doing worship and worship had just become so overwhelming that people had come, come forward and we were just in intercessory prayer or God would just speak a word over people. Usually it's a word of encouragement. Usually it's people that are in pain. Usually it's people that just need to be encouraged. And we've just had those moments where the Holy Spirit would just take over the whole thing and the cue sheet is no longer relevant. <laughs> the clock is no longer dictating the time. God's doing something supernatural. So I'm usually thinking, stay out of the way and begging the question, Lord, what do you want to do? What do you mm. want to do? And there's an old song that I love. It captures the heart. It says, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. So it's a plea to say, Lord, if you're moving, please, can I, can I be a part of it? Please, would you use me? Because that's the only place I want to be used. That's the only place I want to be. Lord, if you're doing something, don't leave me out. Don't do it without me. And that helps me bring a posture to that space to be available to him. Um, And that's spiritually, you know, uh, freshly confessed sins, um, freshly forgiveness extended. And Lord, I don't want anything to be in me that's not like you that would then cause you 
that would then hinder my ability to be used by you. So it's really a lot of Albert Tate, get out the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we all, because I'm, I'm going to think back as a preacher myself. Yeah. You know, I think getting out of the way, forgetting about yourself is really important. And yet that self-awareness is always with me mm-hmm. heading into, you know, to step on the stage or to step yeah. behind a pulpit or that kind of thing. And I think there are days where I really was expecting God to do something and then it felt like nothing happened. Yeah. And there are other days where I thought, oh, this is like a B minus halfway through or whatever. And then something really erupts, like something yeah. really happens. Yeah. How do you, and this again, maybe we may have a lot of unanswerable questions yeah. here because yeah. there is a, a mysterious component to yeah. preaching that I haven't fully figured out. But how do you position yourself so that those transcendent moments happen more regularly, not less regularly? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I don't think you can plan no. revival at 11, 10 no, a.m. No, no, no. Like you I, can't schedule it. You can't schedule it. You got to trust the Word to do its work. Mm. So you be diligent. You be faithful. But when I stand up there, Lord, all the expectation is on you. Because mm-hmm. if I look at the crowd and I'm dependent on them and they quiet on me, then all of a sudden I'm in discouraged and I'm not. Uh, no, let the Word do its work. <laughs> And don't depend on the response of anyone or anything other than God to be your source and your inspiration. Now, I get it, and I love the crowd response. I love engagement. I love interaction. But sometimes God's God's doing something different in the room. So you just, you just got to trust that. Because there are times when I walk away and I'm like, I don't know. If, uh, can we take that offline? Can we just uh-huh. make sure? I mean, I know uh-huh. we preach in the room, but can it not live in effigy like forever <laughs> online? Like, but even then, it's God's word. If it if it was God's word, it's not going to return void. So right. trust the trust the text to be faithful and put your expectation on God. And that's a discipline. That's a discipline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you've hinted at something that brings back lots of memories for me. That moment when you're partway into a talk, could be early on, halfway through or whatever, and it's just not landing. Yeah. And you get into that headspace where you're like, wow, they didn't laugh or they didn't respond or they're not nodding or some guy's on his phone and I don't think he's taking notes. Yeah. Like, you know, you're in that space. And I find I have to be very careful or I go down a very negative spiral quickly where I'm almost like, can we just cut this? Like, we'll just do a four-minute message. Wow. Have, have, Have you... Do you go there? And if so, what do you do to get yourself out of that? It has definitely happened to me. It hadn't happened in a in a while. But I remember when I first started preaching, I just remember preaching and hearing the words come out of my mouth and thinking to myself, this doesn't even make sense to me. <laughs> like, I don't know. But I didn't pull, I didn't, I didn't pull out. I I I just kind of kept going. And I've just found a landing spot. And we can always have extended time in prayer. Like, we can always pray a little longer. You know what? I sense that the Lord wants us just to stop and and marinate this in prayer. So let's just go into prayer. And prayer is always worthy and able and available. <laughs> so, but no, I do have those moments where it gets a little stale. I'll try to find my way. And I've done, uh, you know, emergency landings. I'll land early and spend time in prayer and sincerely say, Lord, I said what I said. And, and I, it was the word, Lord, would you use it? Would you minister now more than I obviously can with this sermon? So we have a little prayer time. That's my exit strategy. <laughs> Do you find you're a good judge of whether a sermon went well or poorly? No, I'm not. Okay, neither am I. I'm not. I'm not. That's mm. why I have to release the expectation because I'll get yeah. in the car and be like, Ugh, and then somebody will call crying saying, it changed my life. It was forever. Yeah. And so it reminds you as a preacher we're, you're not a communicator. You're a preacher. So you're not dealing with an idea that you hope somebody grasps. No, you're dealing with the Word of God, which is transformative. It is powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. We are dealing with something that is supernatural. So it's going to do a work way beyond your capacity to interpret understand, critique, or judge at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So God just saying, bro, your job is to be faithful. Yeah. And it's my job to bring about transformation. So chill, go to brunch. You have a day. <laughs> so be faithful, study. That now, now to, to to flip it, there have been times when I've been ill prepared. Okay. And I feel that and I lament that. And and even when I even try to take that to God, 
I mean, I, I talk about this. There, there have been times when I've just said, Lord, I'm just so unworthy this week. I hadn't studied like I should. I hadn't prayed like I should. I'm going before your people to preach, and I'm just so unworthy. And I can just hear God saying to me so clearly, Albert, when you studied all week, you still weren't worthy. Mm. When you prayed all week, you still weren't worthy. Do you think it is your worth, your study, that that brings you worth in this preaching moment, did you really think because you studied 18 hours that made you worthy to stand and hold my word and declare it? Bro, this thing has never been about your worth. It's always been about my grace. So those little theological gut punches helps me to stay a healthy preacher with a healthy perspective and a healthy view of what it is that I actually do. And that's really make myself available for God to do the work through me. Yeah, so I want to talk about preparation. Yeah. I want to break down your prep style, maybe how it's changed over the years. Yeah. But when you're when you're preaching at your church, a fellowship church, yeah. uh, how much do you work ahead? How much do you prepare ahead of time versus extemporaneous in yeah. the platform? How does that break down for you, Albert? You know, I've never been proud. I'm always a little embarrassed because I don't have like this nice, clean study. Like you hear with other guys who man, like, on this day I study this and I read these articles right. and I read this commentary and I do. This. And the first uh, draft is done by two ten yeah. on Tuesday. Like yeah. I just, I've never had that. I wasn't. A, I was never a good student in school. The reality is, I'm always writing. Okay. I'm always writing. I'm always looking for illustrations or concepts or thoughts. So I'm never not writing. I'm here at this conference now, and I'm. I'm writing in my head. I'm listening to other people. I'm thinking, ooh, that's good. Let me write that down. I'm watching Avatar in the I see you moment. I was like, mm, that's iodine. That's a Greek word that means not. I'm not looking at you, but I'm looking into you. I can use that in the movie. So I'm mm. always kind of looking for creative ways to say things in a new way that will inspire and hook people. When I get ready to sit down and write a sermon, so I'm working on Nehemiah right now as a church. We're work preaching through the series so I will read Nehemiah, um, read different translations of it, uh, usually. I would um, then go to some of my favorite commentaries, uh, get the historical context. What's happening? I haven't preached in the Old Testament in a long time. What's the sequence of events? What's, so Ezra just got done. Nehemiah's picking up. Ezra built the temple. Nehemiah's job is to build the wall. So just getting some of the cultural landscape of the text. Um and then I sit down and I just begin to say, Lord, what do you want to say with this passage? What's uh, 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 Wayne uh, Cordero calls it the Holy Spirit highlight. What, do, what is the Holy Spirit highlighting in this passage? What is, what is Nehemiah trying to communicate? What are the people who experienced this letter, uh, this, this story, who went through this story, what did they experience? How can I get that in it? And then I begin to craft. Uh, the story. I start with the end in mind. I, my first prayer is, Lord, what do you want to do with this message? Mm -hmm. How do you want to impact people? Carrie, my uh, my um, my my hope is to hijack the lunch conversation. Oh, so that's good. One of the worst insults you can give a preacher is for you to go to lunch after a sermon and they say, "What did he preach about?" And you say, Child, "I have no idea." <laughs> like, I just spent eighteen hours of work in that, and you have no idea what I said. Uh huh. So my hope is to hijack lunch so much so that you cannot not talk about the sermon this morning. It's like, okay, okay, get them grits, but then I gotta tell you about the sermon. I gotta tell you. So my hope is to make it make it so impactful. So I start with the ending of the Lord, what do you want it to do? And then I begin to work my way backwards and say, what's the best way to get there? Um, I, I love to create a problem and then have Jesus solve it. Mm -hmm. uh, I love like, to, Do you come up with the solution first and then the problem or the problem and <laughs> then the solution? Usually when I'm saying, Lord, what do you want to do? That's the solution. And then I just go through the work backwards of why is that not being done? Or why is that challenging mm -hmm. for us to do? Mm -hmm. Or what what gets in the way? What's most likely getting in the way of what the Lord wants to do? And I start by talking about that thing. Right. So I start with the problem, knowing that Jesus is going to provide the answer. It's like Matlock. My grandmother used to watch Matlock all the time. And I said, Grandmama, why you watch Matlock? It's the same thing every week. Uh, the Matlock. Somebody gonna be in trouble. He gonna go to court. He gonna win the case, and it's gonna be over. She said, "Oh, baby, you don't watch Matlock." 
to see if he going to win every week. No, you watch Matlock to see how's he going to pull it off this time. <laughs> I think people know Jesus is going to win every week uh -huh. in the sermon. They're just coming to see how's Jesus going to do it this time. Mm -hmm. What problem, what situation, what tension, how am I going to be invited to overcome and to be more like Jesus this week? And what are the things that I get to surrender this week? So I try to, I try to put together the pieces like that so that when people leave, they feel like, um, I want to know Jesus more and I want to know my Bible more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you're taking notes randomly, because I agree, insights hit, hit you at the most inconvenient yeah. time, yeah. not just in the shower, but on walks in the forest, yeah. when you're at a conference, when you're listening to somebody else, when you're driving to lunch, how do you capture them? Or do you capture them? I capture them on my phone in the Notes app. In the Notes app. Pretty so the simple. Notes app is, is changed the game. I used to have um, a, a book that I would just write stuff in, mm -hmm. like a little journal type thing. But now that I got the Notes app, because whatever device I open up, it's on it. So I always have access to it. And I just have, and if it has a theme, or I'll just put at this conference, Carrie Newhoff is talking, here are some notes. Uh, or then sometimes I'll categorize them, uh, thoughts on culture um, and church, thoughts on leadership, uh, sermon illustration idea. And then I just load it up. And then every now and then before I study, I'll just flip through the notes I've written and see if anything springs up, see if anything uh -huh. pops up that's relevant to my current text that I'm dealing with. Super nerdy. Do you have separate notes for separate ideas, like sermon notes or thoughts on culture, or is it like one big document? Mark Mark Batterson has one massive Word document that's probably the longest Word document in the world. I tend to do like sermon, I have it in Evernote, because I've been using Evernote uh -huh. for 100 years before there were notes, and it's like Sermon Ideas 2023. Oh, wow. So I just have it there, and then it, it, it's like a dumpster fire once you get below that. I'm, my whole notes is like that. It's just all the dumpster yeah. fire. Yeah. But there's, it's not one document, but it's just a bunch of them. But most of them are just sermon ideas. And it's all searchable. It's all searchable. I just mm -hmm. typed in, I can type in a phrase, and it comes right up, and it's making, it's, oh, it's, so, it's so helpful. Great. So let's talk about um, how far in advance you work. Okay. And it's okay. This can be confession time. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. Sunday morning, 4 a.m. I start the message. Uh, no, how, how far in advance do you work ahead? Post-COVID, we do, we video the sermon. So we film on like Tuesday or Wednesday. So you got to be done. So I got to be done, which has helped me get my weekends back. Because usually if I'm carrying the sermon, I don't feel like I'm done writing the sermon until I've actually preached it. Okay, I know other people who feel the same way. I feel the same. Whereas I, I could be done a month in advance and I'm done. No. Uh, Weird. I'm, okay. I feel like I'm done writing after I've preached it one time and then I know where everything is because I haven't I haven't had my audience contribute to the sermon yet. Ah. Uh, so when I when I preach, even with the video, there's an audience there and there are things that just happen in the room with people for me that don't necessarily happen when I'm writing. In that extemporaneous exchange and moment with them and their energy often adds to my sermon. Yeah. Not necessarily time, but like content, or they help me know what's what hits and what doesn't hit. I, there have been times when I wrote something I thought, oh, this is going to hit in the room hard. This is going to be powerful. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah. once I say it, it's like crickets. Uh -huh. And then there's something that was just a cursory, just a, a throwaway thought that blows the room. Like they're like, Whoa. And it's like, really? That was good. Uh -huh. Okay, let me go back and start. <laughs> so then I take that. And then when I come back from their contribution to it, their input, oh, the sermon's at a whole nother level. Okay, so how does that work then? You're filming on a Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. Is that for online or it's for online? For yeah. online. Okay. Uh -huh. And then you go deliver live on the weekend? Then I go deliver live on the weekend. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of like the feedback session. Yep. 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 It's kind of okay. feedback. You know, you know, people. It's a good sermon. It just when you when you add a thousand people in the room, I'm sorry, it makes a difference. The yeah. energy and the interaction and that kind of stuff. Yeah. How many people do you have for a Tuesday night? Anywhere from ten to twenty people. Yep. yep. So it's like a studio audience. Yep, a little studio audience just to get reaction and get people mean so much to the preaching moment. Yeah, it me. does. There's some people that it doesn't it doesn't matter. They're just looking at and they just preaching. For me, they oh man, they contribute. What is that? I think I, it, could, it could be my black church tr tradition experience. It's very uh, in interactive. We talk to one another. Uh -huh. We preach this thing together. I had an Aunt Vicky that when I when you preach something really good, 
She would say, come on with some more. <laughs> but you got to watch out, Vicky, though, because you get to go in, and then she would say, bring it on home now. <laughs> <laughs> let's see, wind it up. Wind it wind up. It, come on now, let's take it on home now. <laughs> so they, there, was a, there was this beautiful exchange, this interaction. It's kind of like the um, Seattle Seahawks, they call their fans uh, the 12th man, the 12th oh. member. As if the, the the fans of the 12th member of the football team, yep. because they've noticed over the years, they really do play a role in the outcome of the game. Yeah. Like, yeah. There home are teams, field advantage. Home right? field advantage and the level of noise that they create and the level of energy that they can create, they can shift games at the mark of a dime. Uh, and, and I think audiences and preaching is a, is a little bit like that. Obviously... Uh, your time at Presbyterian Church, people wouldn't yell at you saying, come on with some Well, more. they're not asleep. They're if not, you're Presbyterian, right, it's right, like, right, okay, right. we apparently do have some people still awake. So right, right, right. Sign. We're in here. But uh -huh. facial response, action, yep. and energy. You just feel, it's about energy, managing energy. I think energy sounds spooky to people, but no. church, we're managing energy. Plus a full the room has worship. its own energy. Yes, yes. And the sermon moment has energy. So it all depends on what's happened before my, I get up when I preach. That has an impact on the energy in the room and how I need to then cultivate. So you pay attention to those things when you're trying to master the craft of communication and preaching in the room. Yeah. Well, obviously, I didn't grow up in a black church, but I would say the same thing as a communicator. It is you are reading the body language yes. of yes. people, and it may be a much more subdued response in my context. But it's but still I, energy. Oh, you can yeah. tell. Yeah. Like they're they're zoning out, they're leaning in. Yeah. Uh, you know what I look for? I, I like the house lights to be up a bit, elbow pokes. Mm. When you see when you see couples Community. poking yeah. each yeah. other, going, yeah. told you, or yeah. see, or listen up. Like, well, see, hey, let me tell you something. At the black church, uh -huh. we'd be slapping each other, <laughs> grabbing each other on. When you get to preaching good, oh my goodness. Oh, we, we can't just sit still. We slapping, high-fiving, pulling each other. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's a beautiful it is a thing. beautiful but, thing. But it's just, it's, it's about creating that response. Because why would not God's word? provoke a response in our mm -hmm. hearts and our souls. Mm -hmm. Whether this response is silence and reflection, tears, a head nod, I think when the Word of God hits our body, uh, there's a manifestation to that power and authority as He's calling us to wherever He's call calling us to Himself. Yeah. Um, uh, I think we respond. And, and anyway, you got freedom to respond. Nod your head, poke your arm, do something. But uh, I love it when it gets physical. I love it when it gets physical, when it gets in the body. And I mean, um, there are times when somebody, and I just, I look up and I'm standing up. I don't know when I stood up. I don't know what caught, but what they said moved me to my feet. Yeah. Communication has the power to do that. We've had those moments here. The Absolutely. preaching masterclass, Absolutely. right? Yeah, it just moves you. Yeah. How do you how do you navigate that kind of audience response in a multi ethnic yeah. context? Yeah. Or, for example, if you were to speak at the GLN, which is not the home crowd for you, Global Leadership Network, right? What how do you how do you navigate that when it's not one culture or one major tradition? Yeah. That's dictating the way an audience the interacts with the communicator. You know, good communication is just good communication. Yeah. A good song is just a good song. A bad song is just a bad song. <laughs> I don't know country music, but I know a good country song. Hey, hey that's the last thing I'm gonna put on my playlist. But hey, that's a good country song. You can, girl, you can sing. <laughs> I ain't grow up with you, but you can sing. So I think don't underestimate the power of just being good at what you do. Yeah. And being authentic, um, even if it's not uh, my my most familiar culture. If I am off, people honor your authenticity. So if you're being yourself, it's just something about you being real that then connects with me. And the other thing is we have to be students of our audiences. Yeah. So I need to know, um, even though it's a diverse crowd, I need to know, okay, what's what's meaningful to them, what's meaningful to them, and what's meaningful to them, and to pull my illustrations, my examples, my stories uh, from areas that they will be familiar with and resonate with. Right. Even if that familiarity is... I'm so out of my comfort zone. Um, I don't even know how to exist here. Just saying that, they are saying, well, I know what that's like. 
Mm -hmm. I've been that way. I was like that mm -hmm. when I went to my in-laws' house when I first time. I know, so I know. So even that, I'm giving them something to relate to. Yeah. I'm finding things for, to relate to. So that's very intentional and very. Um, you got you got to be a student. You got to do the work. Like the Global Leadership Summit is uh, a lot of leader culture, business people, but also pastors. Mm -hmm. But you also got non-Christians and you got Christians. How do you put together a message? Um, and and I start where the room is. But when I'm done, we're going to be where I am. I've seen Jesus. you do that. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, because we talked about this before in a previous episode, but you're not talking about code switching. No, You're no, no, talking no, no. about exegeting your audience the way you would exegete a text. Yes. To make sure that you understand what you're walking into. Yes. yes. So if it's an all-white crowd. If it's an all-white crowd. Carrie, I've had white people jumping and shouting in the aisles. <laughs> as, and as, you would. As, as they respond to the power of God's glory. You just got to give them uh -huh. permission and take them on the journey. And if I'm a good driver, people usually will ride along. So yeah. my last GLS talk a couple of years ago, I ended with a New Orleans marching band with a whole dance crew. And everybody was standing up. Dun, 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 dun. And we was like, we was in New Orleans. It's like, how did you get this room to do this? Well, we started on a journey and I earned their trust and they went along with me. Um, and, and, you know, the obvious thing, I think we, we all know this, but I just want to say it just for the record. God's moving. Yeah. God's yes. moving. The Holy yeah. Spirit's moving. The God is doing something. And, and our natural response to the greatness and the glory of God is also very physical. Right. It's very physical. Like you go to a game, a basketball game. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't care how reserved you are. They dunk that ball. You jumping up. You knocking over somebody's <laughs> beer. I mean, their Coke. Uh, and you, you, you kind of <laughs> got your thing up. There's a natural response to God's greatness when it's articulated beautifully. Yeah. 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 So back to Tuesday. You're yes. recording on yeah. a Tuesday. Yeah. Is there a reason you record a separate online version from your weekend experience, just capturing the first you know, message that you yeah. do on the weekend? Because yeah. I understand why it happened during COVID, but why have you kept that? You know, we feel like the online experience, when it's uniquely designed for people that are watching from a computer or a phone mm -hmm. or YouTube, to give them that more intentionality, to make them the primary audience. Um, for us, we, we, excuse me, for us, we worship in a high school that we set up and tear down. So we've been a set up and tear down church for 11 years. Yeah. So to set up and tear down a full on camera suite every week and get the same quality that we get in the studio. I mean, it's, I mean, that's probably a number we can pay to, to get that. We don't have anywhere near that. So number. then you're not doing that level of production on the weekend. No. Oh, that's a good note for personal no. church or no. for portable churches. Yeah. Yeah, so then you don't have that pressure on a Sunday anymore. No, because to do the live stream, like, there are memes about it. That worship leader that's way, that the mic is way up over here, uh -huh. have it all mixed and blend well. When you can get that and mix it pre and then post it and upload it, the quality is, the gap is Through the roof. huge. Mm -hmm. So to go back to a low-quality stream after we've given them this full studio experience— I almost feel like does them a disservice. Now, people want to be in the room and they want to see what's happening on Sunday because we got such a Sunday culture and they want to hear the live music, the live worship and stuff like that. But we just can't, I just don't think we can give them as good of quality of experience yeah. on Sunday. And I think we're starting, I think people that are online and that's all they've experienced, which we have you know thousands of people that watch online, they love it. Yeah, They're great. And, and the other thing is, if you want to see it on Sunday, because you're so used to seeing it on Sunday, come to church on Sunday. We, come, we got that too. Get out the bed. Come mm -hmm. on over here. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I think we had talked about that with numerous leaders as the pandemic was coming into its yeah. final stages. And they were saying we should keep doing online for the sake of online because it's a different experience. It's like, a different experience. Yeah. It's a totally different experience. Yeah. Are you mixing your music? Yeah. Um, like, because you have a great band. Yeah, we're leading yeah. here. Had lunch with some of them. They're incredible musicians. Yeah. So you're capturing them in the studio for online, and then they're doing live worship. Yeah, so weekend. it's all mixed and mastered. Yeah. So the the quality that we're able to give people on the internet is so significantly way more than what we could get setting up and tearing down every week. So what does the prep process like? You have to be done Tuesday whenever that is, Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday night. So you're clearly probably not starting Monday. Maybe you are. 
But does that mean you're working a couple weeks ahead or, or what does that yeah, look like? Yeah, that means I'm sitting on it. I know Nehemiah's coming. I know the first two Sundays are Nehemiah's chapters one and two and then three mm-hmm. and four. So I'm studying it, I'm maturating on it, but I'm not sitting down and actually finalizing and writing it until the night before. Got it. So you're yeah. doing that on Monday the, night. The Monday night or or we because we filmed Tuesdays uh, actually at like eleven o'clock um in the morning. Or one o'clock in the morning. Or one. Not one o'clock in the morning. One o'clock. One, in the one after after one lunch. After, one after, p.m. after lunch, yeah. Because we change around if, if I'm traveling or something like that. But usually whenever I've got to deliver it, I'm spending the previous twenty four hours maturating in it. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah. if I gotta preach Tuesday night or Thursday night, I'm not gonna sit down and because I want it, I want that burden to be fresh when I deliver it. So I usually block it out. Unless if I'm traveling, I'm preaching something I've preached before, something like that. But when I'm preaching a yeah. brand new sermon, yeah. 24 hours before I say it out loud, I'm mentally sitting in it. I'm physically writing it out. I'm capturing the outline. I'm doing that. I'm not doing that two or three weeks before. Never. I never do that. How much time do you spend after Tuesday if you've gotten that feedback? Or do you just kind of like take a few mental notes and bring it again on the weekend? Yeah. I wake up Sunday morning, um, an hour earlier, and I watch the sermon. Oh, wow. While I'm getting ready or doing it. And I just That's preach, a good idea. And I just read. And so, because there may, might have been things that came up that I wanted to like, ooh, that was good spontaneous for you. I need to lock that in. So I'll edit my outline while I listen to myself preach, brushing my teeth, shaving, getting ready or whatever. And I'll just make little notes. And then it's fresh again because I I need a fresh burn. In order for me to preach well, I need I need the burden to go from my head to my gut. It is at my soul. Yeah. So I want to bring that burden to bear to the people. So I I don't want to just walk up raw. So I'm listening to worship. I'm listening to the sermon, and I've got the problem, and I've also got the thing that God wants to do with the people. And I walk in the church holding that in my belly. What? Yeah level of notes do you carry with you on a Tuesday when you're filming or a Sunday morning? Have you got full manuscript, bullet points, rough idea where you want to go? Like how much of it is written and rehearsed versus Mm -hmm. extemporaneous? I've got, um, I do like thought blocks. So I have three big thoughts that I walk up with. I know what those thoughts are um, and I know the content in those thoughts but all I'm memorizing are the thought blocks. And then I hit the thought block, and then I just know what makes up this block. It's like looking, uh, E. Dewey Smith talked about this last night. It's like looking at a house. I know that this is the living room. I know that over there is the bathroom, and I know that over there is the kitchen. Today, I'm doing the, the living room, the kitchen, and the bathroom. I already know in the living room of my first point, there are two couches and a chair. Mm-hmm. I know that there is, uh, Lazarus got sick, uh, Mary and Martha had to wait, um, and then Jesus wept. I know that in the kitchen, um, why did Jesus weep? Um, and why did Jesus need help moving the stone out of the way when he could have done it anyway himself? But God wants us to participate in the miracle, so he invites us to move the stone away. So I know that's in that. I know that's in. I know that part is in the kitchen. I know that line. You, you see what I'm saying? I see. Exa- so, you know, I'm very similar. Yeah. So I. So I. Once I get those big blocks, and then an intro, and then a. Lord, how do we want to close it? What do we want to do? What's what, what's our spiritual response? Right. Are we singing a song? Are we sitting in prayer? Are we celebrating? What's the response? So I got an intro. Uh, I know how we're going to begin. Very practically like a story or a joke. or a, So a very clear intro and then a very clear vision of how we're going to end in the three thought blocks. And that's when I walk to the stage with mentally. But I don't carry any paper or any notes. You just kind of know. I memorize we're going. that and I take it up. I, I go up with that. Yeah. 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 What happens, and I'm sure it's happened at different points over the years, probably more in the early days, because people watching this or listening to this are probably going, well, I'd love to do that, but I don't, like, what if I forget the second block? Yeah. Have you ever had that? Like, what happens? I remember the first time I freed myself from notes and I'm like, I had this little voice in my head that it's like, they don't know what you forgot. Keep going. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Are you similar? Yeah. Yeah, no, I can't make a big deal. It very seldom happens. When it does happen, especially I'm getting older and I'm 45, it's it's scary. It's yeah. like scary, scary. But if I've sat with it and prepared, that usually doesn't happen. But if it does, I just keep going. I know where the next room is in the house. So mm-hmm. I forgot I forgot two things that's in the living room, but 
all right, let's just go into the kitchen. I know what's in there. Uh -huh. So I just take, I go to the next point. Yeah, yeah. And nobody ever complains when you finish early. They have no idea what happened. <laughs> nobody yeah. was saying, it felt like you missed the second or third point. It's like, uh -huh. oh, yeah, I just kind of keep going. But that's why you got to study and be confident because all I got is the blocks. So mm -hmm. I got to, I got to remember them. Yeah. Um, multiple services on Sunday. Mm -hmm. You can have a great message for the first service, second one, it falls flat. Yeah. I always like it when the first one doesn't quite work because then I like I can top it. Yeah. But if I'm doing two or three reps on a Sunday and the first one is like, I don't know how to make that better, oh, oh, I find that very demotivating. It is the one of the worst things. Okay. The worst things that can happen. Not alone. Is you have a great first service. <laughs> <laughs> Except if you're there at the first service. Except That's there, fantastic. Right, for your audience. But, but what uh, I had to learn as a preacher, that was a big problem. I would always, oh, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the, 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 my comfort level, because it's not even about the sermon being good. The sermon was good probably both times. Really yeah, good. yeah. Your your experience delivering it was better in one of the services. Right. And, and you probably hit some things or whatever, but you just had more fun. You had a really good time at the nine. Mm -hmm. And then at the 11, you just can't do this. You tr you try to chase the fun you had at the nine. Yes. You cannot Bingo. chase it. Mm -hmm. You cannot say, well, I got to remember how I said that, how I said that, because of the timing of that, you got to start over. You got to say, that was a great experience. I'm forgetting everything that happened. And I'm starting from ground zero at the next service. If you don't do that, you are creating just mental despair on yourself. <laughs> yeah. Because you're chasing the that wind. That didn't land. That yeah. didn't land yeah. like it did a nine. Yeah. You're chasing it. You can't yeah. chase it. And it's a different crowd. It's a different people. It's a different rhythm. I've tried the same little one, two kind of, woo, I got that. In the next service, flat. Not even there. Uh -huh. Not there. Uh -huh. The energy. So you got to read the room. It's a, such a big part of preaching that we don't talk about. We read notes instead of reading people. So when you can <laughs> get off your notes and read the people, you give them a fresh encounter. You give them a fresh experience. Don't try to microwave what God did in the last service. God is like, oh, I can do, I can do something fresh. I can do something new. We don't need to microwave it. I'm good at that. I've got enough sovereignty and goodness and grace where I can give this second and third service a fresh encounter of my presence and my glory. And by the way, Mr. Preacher, I can give you a fresh encounter and fresh expression of my glory as well. So I've learned just to start from scratch every service. How did you learn that? From chasing it and failing <laughs> and feeling terrible about a good service that I couldn't match what God is like, God, whoa, he did that. And so I'm thinking in the second service, okay, I got I, I, I to add that. I got to say that. And then when I'm preaching in the second service, when I'm not feeling the momentum that I had at the first one, I'm now discrediting what God is doing in the second service yeah. because I'm, I'm comparing and I'm losing by comparing. And this is a good start and it's going room because this room, the momentum may show up in a different, completely different spot because God has assigned 17 people to this service to hear one thing that you don't even know about because of what they're going through. And because of what they're going through, God is going to move this way to capture this audience who wasn't at the previous service. Mm -hmm. So I just had to stop playing God with his word and just say, God, you're sovereign. Let me start at ground zero with this sermon and give you an opportunity to be God afresh and God anew in every service. Yeah. I love that perspective because I don't know if this is your experience or not, but I often find that when I'm done and I sit down with the production team or other people that you know we debrief with, the difference in my head, it was like a three versus a nine. Yeah. Probably it was the difference between an 8.2 and an 8.5. Literally. Yeah. Literally. Because what I discovered is it was my experience delivering the message, mm -hmm. not necessarily mm -hmm. the delivery of the message. Correct. I Everything clicked inside of me, and my comfort level was strong, My mm -hmm. comfort, and I just felt great. It's like, I want to feel that again. And we struggle when when we felt a little clunky on the inside or, ooh, I, I stumble, I stuttered. Like if I stutter in the first five minutes, I lose momentum. I just like, oh, I hate to, I hate to fumble a word because now it's not as polished, it's not as clean. So, I just, so I have to say, I have to get out of my way, um, and let God be fresh every time, even in me. Yeah, I gotta ask you this, and I love asking this. Comedy is not my forte. Mm -hmm. I love watching it. I love laughing at jokes, yeah. but like the ability to produce those moments on stage. 
You're one of the best I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. You have a way of just, and I've seen you do that. We were at an event in Nashville. I was thinking about this yes, years yes, ago. Yeah. Remember that at Rocket Town? Uh -huh. and you got up and roasted me. I did indeed. For, and, and I it never was, met you. I never, you've was, never met me. We didn't even know who each other were. You yeah. totally roasted me, yeah. and it was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't think I wasn't mean though. I don't want you weren't don't mean. Even, I don't but, even forget what I mean, you, said. you clearly couldn't have scripted that. Yeah. That no. was in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about your approach to and I've seen you do it at the GLS. Yeah. Like yeah. I've I've seen you do um in so much of your communication. You're just masterful at knowing what to say, how to say it, comedic comedic timing, yeah. all of the yeah. above. Yeah. Uh, what what goes into that for you? And I know some of that is probably unreproducible. Yeah. But I just love to break that down a little. Yeah. Bit. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I um, I look for things that are happening in the room that we're all thinking, but no one's going to say. But then I say it, and then everyone laughs because I gave them permission to call it. Out. And that's what you did in Nashville. Yeah. You made this joke about me flying private and all this oh, stuff. Oh, you said something about... Oh. I don't know what I said because I've never assume. flown private. Okay. But, okay. but it was really funny. I was, was just like... So I'm trying to think. So I was yeah. doing... Uh, it was like, wouldn't you, wouldn't you like his life? Like, it was <laughs> one of those things. You. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, making, I was making I was poking fun of the white well, guy. It's, it's not my life. It's not... Well, I guess it is like, my life, but... I, you know, I did that yeah. with Francis Chan one time. I made fun of him because he's just so passionate. And I just said, Lord... Would you please bless me to have as much money as Francis Chan so I can be that passionate too? And she was just, <laughs> she was just dying laughing. And I was like, I love Jesus too. If I sold a million copies of my book, that's just, you know, people, most people laugh. Some people were like, well, you know, he gave most of it away. <laughs> uh, he's very generous. I said, I didn't say nothing about his generosity. The Lord blessed him with some money. He made him live alone. I'm, I want the same, bless me, Lord. Even me, Lord. I want to sell a million <laughs> copies. A million. And I I will give God 10 million praises, you know. <laughs> uh, so, but I think you take things that are obvious, things uh -huh. that, that people are thinking uh, and do it. I was at an event the other day and they had this camera production um, and I'm in this intimate moment and the camera guy got the camera and he just goes to capture this moment right in front of the audience and he's like right in front of me and I was like yeah I think the the cameraman thinks he's the Holy Spirit uh, <laughs> I don't think he think people can see him he just moving and I just start moving like him around like he just in front of all this lady can't even see my point because he just standing in front of her like he invisible like Lord you know and everybody just laugh because everybody's thinking that because I know that he's coming across so obvious I can see people checking out on right. me and being distracted by that, but nobody's going to say anything about it. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, they will. I will. And then it gives the room a, a release, and then I get to bring them back in, and I get I get them again, and I get to take them where I want them to go. So I think using comedy very intentionally, physically to make people laugh, it literally physically opens up their chest. It does. And then once it's open, you take the richness of the Word of God, and you punch it right in that opening. And it lands deeper if you're able to master that ratio. And I had spent a lot of time thinking about it. To be honest, it's just kind of something that happens and I just do. But I've seen the fruit of it and people have said, Albert, I was laughing, but then I was crying. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And to allow the word of God to do all of that, because it does. I think Jesus had a ball. I think Jesus and Peter and James and John, that, I think they literally gut laughed a ton. Hmm. While hanging out with the water, hanging out at that wedding with the wine. Can you imagine that night yeah. hanging out with Jesus? They were not serious saying, oh, theologically, what, what a profound experience. <laughs> and the, the elements of the wine transitioning from water. Was there, no, they were like, yo, Jesus, great. Jesus, what's up? And Jesus was like, ah. <laughs> you know, it's like, let's bring that. Let's bring that to the text. Let's bring that to the fellowship there. People need to laugh. People have been depressed, had a hard week. Create some moments for them to laugh. But, but it can also be very dangerous if you don't know the audience. And I've had some terrible fumbles. I've said things that I had to go back and apologize for. So comedy is hard and it is a little bit risky because everybody doesn't think things are funny. Right. So, especially now. Yeah, especially now. So people are super sensitive. So I just make fun of people, of, of, of people being sensitive. I said, like, people are so offended, so easily offended. You got offended. You didn't get dead. Didn't nobody stab you. You just got offended. You know what I'm saying? So just get offended and keep going. Go, what are you doing? You know, so I try to do that to 
help people relax because I know what I'm going to say in a few minutes is probably going to offend them. Yeah. But let me give them permission to be offended and be okay in making fun. Laughter also helps you talk about really, really hard things in a way that allow people to sit with the capacity to talk. Like I talk about race. I talk about politics. To yeah. use humor to help lay the foundation for that is really, really important. Yeah. How much of your humor is pre-planned, pre-scripted versus spontaneous in the moment? Maybe 10% is pre-planned. Yeah. You're just watching I'm sensitive. Just watching and seeing what happens and picking up jokes in the middle of the conversation. Like the that. more prepared I am for comedy, the worse it goes. Yeah, it's yeah. just... And, but, but with that, though, having the discipline to say, if the comedy's not in the room, don't grab it. Don't try oh. to force it. I don't... Okay. I don't I, I've never said I want to go into this sermon and be funny. Wow. That is not an intention at all. And I'm not writing jokes in my sermon... I look for opportunities and moments that seem awkward that I like to call out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that I like yeah. to say, huh, what awkward moment? Like, <laughs> like in, the, in the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost, when Peter grabs the mic to tell everybody, you know, what the Holy Spirit is doing. His opening line to me is hilarious. He's like, hey, everybody, hey, hey, hey. We're not drunk. <laughs> I've never heard that. It's like, like, what? Is that where you, <laughs> why are you starting there? But then what's even funny is his reason why they're not drunk. He says, we're not drunk. It's too early to be drunk. <laughs> it's not like, <laughs> like we shouldn't be drinking. It's like, no, it's just too early. In other words, if it was five o'clock, uh, we could be drunk. But it's 10 a.m. We ain't drunk. It's the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? So... You know, I just think those are moments that make the uh, the message come alive. And it's just like, he really did say that. You got everyone's attention. Yeah, you got everyone's attention. Correct. And now we get to talk about the Holy Spirit coming in a way that feels more realistic and, and more natural. <laughs> we, we, we tend to over-spiritualize the people in the Bible, but they were just really people just like us. So yeah. to humanize them is to humanize the Word of God and its ability to actually penetrate my own heart. I feel bad about asking this question because we're uh, we're on a lunch break while we're recording this. Yeah, it deserves its own hour or more. Yes. Yeah, what can white preachers learn from black preachers? You've got a very multiracial oh, group goodness. here. I know this oh, needs more than yeah. five minutes, but no. But I think I think just that the curiosity. White preachers need to study great black preachers. They need yeah. to study great yeah. Latin preachers. They need to study outside of their sphere. Um, but to talk specifically about black preaching uh -huh. is some of the best preaching in the history of the world. Yes. <laughs> like some of the greatest communicators, E.K. Bailey, E.V. Hill, Tony, Tony Evans, uh, Ralph, Ralph West, like, oh my goodness, these people, G.E. Patterson, um, um, uh, e. Dewey Smith, Bishop Kenneth C. Ulmer, um, Brian Loritz, I think is one of the greatest preachers. Um, there's... I mean, Charlie Dates, Philip Pointer. Um, I'm talking about a wealth of great academic homileticians that are just oh exceptional. So, if if you're not a student of black preaching, um, you should really if you're if you're a preacher or a pastor and this is a craft that you want to cultivate, oh please come on over, come on over, sure. check it out. Um, it will bless your life. Some of the best preaching in the world. Um, the white preachers, I would say, need to need to learn to be uncomfortable with be, need to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, and recognizing that there's a lot that you need to know that you'll never know that you need to know it because of the way your world is set up. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's a lot that you need to know, but there's nothing that's going to come to you and say you need to know this because your world is set up to tell and reaffirm that you pretty much got everything you need. Um, but when you seek the kingdom call and the kingdom assignment, you realize that I'm called to all people, all seasons, and in all stages of life, I need to do the work to sustain that call. So I need to be able to not just preach to people that don't look like me, don't live like me, don't vote like me, but that aren't in the same generation that I'm in. Yeah. Uh, how does a boomer communicate with a Gen Zer? Um, because we steward this book and we're not called just to preach to the 60 plus, we're called to speak to all people. So being a student of the craft, 
I think, drives you in places that should make you uncomfortable. Hmm. Hmm. So. How do you keep growing as a preacher? Y'all? It's so interesting. I'm I'm growing more now through rest. Hmm. Um, and finding healthy rhythms to live in a healthy pace. Um, because I feel like for a season I was running in a way that kept me on empty. And an empty preacher is not a good preacher. Um, so I had to find a way to keep my tank filled so that I can preach from a place of overflow um, and not such levels of deficit. How are you doing that? Um, it's about rhythms, not numbers, um, is this phrase that I've been holding on to. It's this idea of how do I get rhythms and not be driven so much by numbers and outcomes, but be driven by rhythms of rest, presence in God, presence with wife and family and kids, um, presence with with church, presence with myself. And out of that presence, out of that stillness, allowing the Holy Spirit to do His work. Um, Because you can get so busy, you can forget that it's actually the Holy Spirit's work. Yeah, yeah. You think it's my work. Um, So I think finding rhythms of rest to be reminded, oh, it's God's work. The Spirit's writing these sermons. The Spirit is moving. The Spirit is saving people. The Spirit is building His church, not you. So how do you stay in a posture that reminds you of that on a regular basis, lest we forget too often? I think my biggest growth as a preacher is coming from me finding rest as a son. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, people want to learn more. Are you doing the Preaching Master Class again next year? Yeah, it's going to I'm doing it next year. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're just barely at the beginning of 2023, but yeah. uh, where can people learn more, Albert? PreachingMasterclass.com. Okay. Check us out there. And then all of my socials are Albert Tate. So mm-hmm. Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. You know, um, I had a twerking video to go viral on TikTok. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, all my albertate.com, they can see up. But the Preacher Masterclass is an exceptional space where it's a multi ethnic space and also men and women in the same room. Yeah, yeah. Most conferences don't have, like, women have their own thing on speaking, and a lot of the dominant preaching conferences are just primarily men. Here we got women and men learning together in the same room, which I think is a beautiful space. And very that's diverse. Also valuable. Yeah, so very diverse. So we really appreciate that. So, and we appreciate you being here. I appreciate and am, am floored to be invited, yeah. yeah. but I am learning loads. Albert, it's a thrill to always sit down and talk with you. Always good to be on the you Carrie so Meehoff show. Uh, how, how, by the way, real quick, mm-hmm. how's the, how the show going? Are, this seems, uh, Great. We never talk about how the show is doing. It's it's growing more every year, and I really? don't fully understand why. We've had hockey stick growth over the last couple of years. So really? 27 million downloads and counting. and Carrie. Uh, I think we'll see 8 million this year. Based on current trends, so we're well. Very this excited. episode is going to do a million. Well, it'll do a million easy. Me and Francis easy. Chan's book, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? There we go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks, so we're man. really grateful. Thank Always you so good. Much. Okay. <laughs>It's a completely different experience when you see it face to face. Being able to see how a child and how families are taken care of through what happens within the context of the local church and seeing how compassion comes alongside local churches to empower them to make a difference. One of the significant things that compassion has done in the life of our church is inspire people to understand that the gospel, the real gospel, requires justice and it requires mercy. Our partnership with Compassion International has just taken our external focus to a new level as a church, which I felt God wanted us to have. And there is an energy in our congregation about making a difference on the other side of the world. At the end of the day, I'm a local church guy. I think it's one of Compassion's distinctives is all of their work is done through the local church on the ground. As you come close to people in the global world, God will teach you things about yourself that you would have never otherwise learned. And so it's beautiful to be able to come alongside Compassion so that you can grow in your view and your perspective of God. I see Compassion as an on-ramp, and it's really given us the opportunity to share the importance of sharing with others. It's really increasing our capacity as an entire church to love and to look beyond our own selves and to see the needs of others. I look at Compassion as a real gift to 
how we could really shape and impact the heart of our congregation to be more in alignment with the heart of God. This is a great partnership. It's a great tool that helps get people to join in something that's building the kingdom of God. Our partnership with Compassion, it really allows us to see and do what the Bible calls us to do. And that's what we want at the end.